You're listening to another episode of the Smart Agency Masterclass, and I'm your host, Jason Swank, where I believe that systems outperform talent, and having the right systems in place is the difference between you growing and scaling your agency faster and easier. Now, in today's show, I have an amazing guest who is going to cover eight to nine things you need to do to make your next speech on stage unforgettable. And a lot of these, man, all of them, I really like all of them, but they're going to make a huge difference in the business that you get from actually getting on stage. Hey, Mike, what's, welcome to the show. <laughs> See, we already all screwed up. <laughs> yeah. There we go. There we go. Hello, Jason. Thank you for having me. Hey, I'm happy to be here. Awesome, man. Well, for those that um, don't know who you are, tell us a little yeah. bit about your story and uh, who you are, and then we'll jump into how they can just deliver killer speeches. Yeah, totally. So I was... Um, I was a guy who wanted to go back to grad school and uh, become a college professor, and I was on track to do that, but like, I don't know, two months into that program, it was just like, oh, this is nothing like what I thought it was going to be. And that's a hard thing. So I was a guy who uh, was trying to figure out what to do and was trying to pay off grad school, so I, I got a job and was doing adjunct professor stuff on the side, and I had a guy from, uh, I won't say what company, but a large shoe company outside of Portland who for some reason came to my class and said, you seem like an engaging presenter. Uh, I work at this large shoe company and we'd love to have you present on campus sometime. So I'm like, okay, seems like something I should do. Um, put together a talk for that. And it was like, it was good. It was like a B plus, like it wasn't the best thing I've ever done. And that's the one that you want to, you know, knock out of the park. Um, so I started doing some research and I'd actually done some research a little before that talk and I found this company down in uh, Silicon Valley, which I didn't even know, like it was in Mountain View, California, which I didn't, at the time I didn't even know was Silicon Valley. This company is called Duarte and um, one thing led to another. I started doing work there and what I do these days is I fly all over the world doing workshops on how to present better. So That's it's awesome. like workshops on workshops. That's yeah. great. Because workshops on Sorry, let me phrase that. Workshops on presenting. Awesome. Well, you know, that that's great because I always tell agency owners that they need to be the front face for their agency. Like as an agency CEO, that should be the, one of their primarily jobs outside of sharing the vision and direction of where they're going and communicating it to their team. And one of the best ways to do that is to get on stages. Yeah. Right. But I just got back from a conference. I won't tell you which conference it is. And there was a lot of. Are we going to do the whole time? Just like, but I won't tell you who it is. Exactly. But someone important. I think, that's, I think that's we, me and you. Yeah, yeah. That's, we got to do that because then it leaves that open door yeah, and that mystery. and that guess and that mystery. We'll bring them back, or maybe we'll say we'll tell you at the very end. And yeah. well, if yeah. yeah, yeah. And and so all of the speeches I went to were horrible. And so <laughs> I, I'm so glad to have you on the podcast and to go over some of you know, the tips to really make your, your next speech really unforgettable. So, yeah. and I think you have like eight steps, right? Yeah, yeah. Or eight, yeah. eight tips. So what's like yeah. the first one? Yeah, I should give the, uh, the pre-tips are you have to have a good idea and you have to understand your audience. Like that stuff is accepted. Um, if you don't do those two things, then everything I'm going to talk about right here doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. So like if your idea is not good or you're being real technical to an audience that's not technical, things like that, like that, None of this will matter, but yeah, um, I like to. I have like my mental checklist once when I'm putting together a presentation, and I feel like I've got a good idea, I've got a good story together. It's like, how do I make it really, really good now? And I've got a, a checklist of eight things that I suppose I should. Write yeah, what, what's the first yeah. one? <laughs> yeah, the first one actually has to do with uh, the beginning. So I think what most people think that you should do at the beginning is just kind of like state your topic. And what a lot of people do is they do the like, hey, Jason, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'm really happy that this conference is happening. Thank you for coming to my session, right? Like just stalling. And the reason why most of us do that, I think, is because we want to get accustomed to speaking on stage. And I get why that happens, but that is not effective. So what mm -hmm. I advocate for instead is a strong first line. Like literally, first line just drops you right into the middle of the story. 
Yeah. Uh, an example of that that I like to share, Josh Ship is a presenter. Uh, his TED Talk, his first line is something to the extent of, um, I had mastered the art of getting kicked out of homes. So it's like, boom, whoa, where is this going? You're dropped right in the middle. of it. It's like a movie where you just start in battle. It's like, oh, I, I need to pay attention immediately. I'll put down my phone. I'll pay attention to this guy. Uh, I gave a presentation a couple of months back at a conference called Think Better, Live Better. And I just ran with that. So my first line was, it's a humbling moment when you realize you've turned into an a-hole. Boom. Drop people in the middle of it. Whoa. That's not how speeches usually start. So I absolutely love killer first line. Yep. Killer first line is a great way to start, even if it's not that. Something, uh, maybe it's a story, maybe it's um, participating with the audience directly, something that just drops them in the middle of the story you're trying to tell rather than hemming and hawing and saying, oh, it's really nice to be here. Oh, well, New York, really busy in New York. This is how everybody starts speeches. Yeah, I, you know, I totally agree with that. And I was at Traffic and Conversion, and we were in the speaker room, and one of my buddies, Tom, was about to go on lo- or go live. And I said, hey, Tom, what's your opening line? Because it's the most important. He goes, are you kidding me? I'm about to go live. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, which room are you in? I'm going to sit right in the front. Like, So I jinxed him. And so he, he goes up. They, they, uh, the, the person introduces him, and he already kind of felt nervous. And literally, he gets a hug from the girl, knocks the clicker out. So now the pointer doesn't work. The slides <laughs> don't work. He did a great job, just by the way. And I love you, Tom. The blue suit was great. But, you know, he didn't have that opening line. And I, you know, so like when I go on stage, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll come up with some elaborate story. And I'll just say, I was yeah. sitting in my office. I picked up my computer and I threw it through the wall. Love and it, it just like literally rather than. And I think I used to do it very differently. I used to do it wrong where I'd be like, hey, you know, I'm Jason. I'm nervous. I shouldn't be up on stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gosh, the I'm nervous thing. So people think that's this actually, if I could take over your podcast and just transition to the next thing I was going to talk about. uh, The next thing I was going to talk about was being vulnerable with the audience. But what people think that means is you should say things like I'm nervous or I'm sick. What that does is it draws attention to a weakness. Like you would never do that in regular. Well, no, people do that in regular life, but it's not a strong move in regular life. Mm -hmm. That is the equivalent of saying like, uh, I've got a big zit on my forehead. Can everybody see it? Right? Like why? (laughs) Like we're trying to present ourselves as having thought through things, having great ideas and being confident. And what a lot of us do instead is we're like, do you see the pimple in my forehead? Yeah. It's really big. And it's right. So what you want to do instead of that is you want to share something with the audience that says, I'm not perfect. But the, the difference here, so it might be I'm not perfect. It might be just a situation where I didn't know what to do. Uh, a time in my life where I screwed up something that was hard. You want to share that stuff. But what you want to do is you want to show your audience how you transitioned out of that. Yeah. So here was this thing that I screwed up. Here's what I learned from it. Yeah. Or here is a situation where I didn't know what to do. I was feeling really, really stressed out. My blood pressure was high. This presentation is the story of me getting better at that. Yeah. It just gives them the empathy, right? So they can connect totally. with you rather than yeah. they like look at me up on my high horse on stage, right? Right. Right. There's um, the look at me. I'm on my high horse. That kind of the population that works for. It is possible, but it doesn't usually work. Gotcha. So what's uh what's yeah. the next what's the next one after you show your vulnerability? Yeah, and I should I should like just say these aren't necessarily in any order, although sure. it probably sounds like they are. Uh, the next one is evidence based authority. So what I mean by that, um, let me give a dating example. So I didn't get married until a little later. In I mean I'm not like 75 or anything, but uh, I got married when I was 37. It's not that old, but it's older than what what, what I'm saying, Jason is I hit a stage where people started asking, started just giving me unsolicited advice. Right? <laughs> there you go. So, oh, you should do this or you should do that. But here's the deal. That advice was always just, here's what I did. That's what they're really saying. It's like, remember this one guy who took me out to breakfast and he's like, well, yeah, you know, I, I feel like you're a good catch and da 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 And I'm like, okay. And then he gives me this advice and he's like, you need to treat it like a job. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, you need to treat looking for a wife like it's a job i'm like well if it were a job i would quit (laughs) as if it was look sorry as if it was looking for a job and i was like well if i were looking for a job i'd have like spreadsheets and i'd be 
like keeping track of my, you know, where I sent my resume to and stuff. And he's like, yeah, you should do that. I'm like, and this guy was oh. married. <laughs> yeah, no, he, but see, that's what worked for him. <laughs> but like this enters into a total survival bias. People love giving that advice. People love using the Steve Jobs quote about like, you have to do something you love. And that worked for Steve Jobs and it works for other people too. But where I'm going with this is that trying to think like your audience, your audience can immediately have just this thought in their head of like, yeah, but that won't work for me. Yeah, but that, I don't know if that works. So what's stronger is if you are adding some sort of statistical or, um, like scientific basis to that. So that could be, you know, there was a study done at UC Berkeley sort of thing. It could just be like, I looked at the top 10 campaigns that my agencies run and nine of those 10 had this thing in common. Like that is so much stronger than just saying most of our clients do blah, blah, blah. It's I looked at the top 10 and nine of the 10 had these things. I love it. Yeah, you know, I... People would always kind of come up to me and, and sometimes I do this to people too. Yeah. Like you, you, and you just do it because you, you see, you see something that you could fix and then you just start throwing up on them. Totally. Yeah. Right. And it's uh, it's challenging. So, so but like that, but Jason, that makes sense in regular life where you're just, most people don't walk around, you know, like when I'm walking around, someone asks me for advice. It's not like I've got this file in my head that like, I, I'm not like Sherlock where I'm just like, okay, well, let's just think through our last 10 clients and this one did this and this one did this, right? So that makes sense in regular life. But when you're on stage and you've had a chance to prepare, like you actually can attach data to that and that's going to be stronger for your audience. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I mean, just being like, well, this worked for this person, this, these results and uh, yeah, that'd be great. So what is, what's the next one? What's, uh, I think we're at number four or five. Yeah, we're at number four. Uh, this one, I mean, you and I have kind of discussed it already, but sharing anecdotes and stories, sometimes those are from your own life, sometimes those are others. Uh, industry stories are really strong. Mm -hmm. um, I like to always point out here, like the most popular TED Talk, Sir Ken Robinson, it's got like 45 million views now. Essentially, that is a collection of stories, like really, really good stories. Some of those are his own. Some are stories he heard from other people that he merges together to prove his bigger point. So anecdotes and stories, I mean, uh, you know, this isn't exactly new information for your audience. Storytelling is a pretty big buzzword these days. Mm -hmm. We're hardwired for story. And we will remember story way better than we will remember just random bits of information. And I think what most people try to do is, I think a lot of presentations are basically like verbal Wikipedia entries. Oh, yes. You know? Very like, painful. Well, I, I come from this company and we have this many clients and we've got locations and here, here and here. And like, that's wonderful. But you know, what's stronger is if you can put a story around that, like, yeah. how did you know it was time to open your next office? Cause one day, um, you needed to be in, you know, you had an office in Atlanta and you needed, and you had all these clients in Austin and one of them asked you to get something over to them by four o'clock. And you're like, wow, that's going to be a bit of a chore. Right. I mean, that's not the greatest story you can come up with, but just examples like that way more powerful than just saying we have offices here. We have offices yeah. here. We have this many employees. Well, they're going to remember the story, right? Yeah. I mean, stories and people can relate to a story, especially if you have a villain or, totally. or yeah. you have, you know, that person overcoming something that they can see in that, that they, they can kind of relate to. And they'd be like, oh man, if that person can do that. That's kind of yeah, what yeah. I was. I mean, that's yeah. why, like, if you look at all these commercials for like uh, P90X and you yeah. see like the before and after, it's like, dude, we're just normal people and we're yeah, right, right. They don't kind of transform. You, you, they don't show you the jacked guy who's like, no. I always knew I could do it. Right. Right. Like, that's right. not a commercial. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Never. So, yeah, stories are great. <laughs> I wanna take a minute and tell you about Quilla, which is our episode sponsor. And it's an amazing proposal software. They save you time and help you close deals a lot quicker by eliminating that boring old proposal. They allow you to create stunning website proposals with video, image galleries, form. Your prospect can sign and even pay 
online. It integrates with your project management software, your accounting software, and so much more. From my own experience, if I could go back in time with my agency, I would definitely check out Quilla. So I want you to go to jasonswank.com slash proposal software. That's jasonswank.com slash proposal software. And then, you know, what's uh, what's number five? Because I like this one. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of presentations just end. And when, like every presentation ends in the sense of the person literally stops talking. Better presentations have two things at the ending. Um, and I broke these up into two different parts. But better presentations have a call to action and then a final closing statement. So here's the key with the call to action, though. What a lot of people, like the chic thing to do these days is uh, is a call to action from stage. It's like, if you text your number to such and such, then you will get a copy of my slides or you'll get my PDF. And that's great, especially for agencies. Like that's great for collecting email addresses and things like that. But the problem with that is that you are only taking them part of the way through what you're trying to do in that talk. Like you're getting their information, you're giving them your slides or whatever your giveaway might be. But now your audience feels like they're done. Like they got that little dopamine hit, like they got that free thing on their email that they may or may not ever open. They feel like they're done. So th what I would encourage you to do, that's like your short-term call to action. I would give them an assignment that's for three months down the road. So three months from now, here, as a result of this talk, here's what you should be doing. Oh, I like that. Yeah, and three months is somewhat arbitrary, but give them a, a longer term call to action. So in a week, you need to be doing this. In a month, you need to be doing this. Just something that's beyond the five minutes immediately after the talk. I like it. And is that the, does that go into the last one? You know, tell the audience about the traps? Yeah, exactly. So, um, okay. So especially for agencies, like here's every, every designer I've ever spoken to. I realize this is not what they would do from stage on a conference, but it's like every designer I've ever talked to when they present their work back to a client, they'll just be like, okay, well, here are three logos we came up with. Tell me which one you like the best, right? And it's like, worked a week trying to cut, like 40 hours trying to come up with those logos and you're just like, well, tell me what's the best one. And every designer that I talk to is like, the client always either picks the very worst of those or they try to you know, merge two different ones into one, mm -hmm. okay. That designer knows that ahead of time. That's like every single client. So if you know that ahead of time, what you should do is you should warn your audience of what the traps might be from what you're presenting. So let's just keep using that as an example, even though it's not like a keynote. If you know that your audience is gonna be saying, okay, well, I like, I like number seven, and you know that seven's the worst one, or you know that they're gonna try to combine two of them, what I would advise you to do instead is to proactively say, now you might be tempted to try to combine a couple of these. Here's why it's better to keep them as is. Like if you know that already, yeah. warn them of that trap. Warn them of that thing that they might think is the right move. Yeah. I'm a big fan of just starting, starting sentences by saying like, you might think that blank, but actually we should do blank instead. Your yeah. audience, like especially if you've done a good job with your talk, something that happens is you, you actually start to, like you can actually simplify your topic to a level where it sounds easy, they don't need to hire you. Oh, agency works a breeze, right? It's really, really easy mm -hmm. to do that if you've made your talk good. And if you've made your talk good, then your audience might start tuning out because it's actually too simple. In that scenario, warning them of traps that they may encounter shows how credible you are, shows that you've thought about their world, and it's just making for a better talk. Yeah, I love the traps, you know, because especially at the conferences, like literally the traps that they run into is, is they have so much information, they don't know where to start, yeah. right? Yeah. And, or they're not looking for that one thing that they can just latch onto and then go implement and then go on to the next thing. And I love warning them about that. I love the call to action. Like my, my favorite is is the opening, right? Because you got to hook them or they're going to yeah. be like silent. It's kind of like a video, yeah. right? You got like eight seconds yeah, right, right. or they're yeah. just going to be like, oh, yeah. onto the next cat video yeah. or, or a dog chasing the car down the road, right? And then I love kind of like, you know, the telling the stories and then 
connecting some kind of call to action. You know, that's something I always try to do at the end of the podcast of going like, hey, if you took away one thing, what's that one thing? Go implement it. And then, but I've never done kind of the trap and be like, hey, you might be wandering into this. So that, that's cool. I like, I like these things. These are good. Yeah. And if, and if trap is, if that seems too vague, I mean, trap is basically saying, trying to put yourself in your audience shoes and saying, if mm-hmm. they misunderstood me, how would they misunderstand me? And then proactively countering that. But if you're saying, oh, I can't think of what that is, just think of any resistance they might have. Basically, any speech you can say, like resistance from the audience is, I'm too busy. Oh my gosh, that sounds really hard. I mean, that's basically any speech. Yeah, exactly. So if they're going to say that, like, I actually like to challenge them out loud. You might be thinking, this is too hard, or I'm really busy. Here's something easy you can start with. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Well, is there anything that I did not ask you or that we did not cover that could help out my audience? Yeah, I think, uh, well, I didn't talk about the the final closing statement. Is just some, is like a final go do this, like a final encouragement. Okay. Uh, so that's that's one thing. Like a Jerry Springer fi- final thought? <laughs> <laughs> wow. I haven't thought about Jerry Springer in so long. Jerry, no, it's, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> it's more like, it's more like um, I want to leave my audience on a high note. I want to leave them feeling good about my talk. So whether it's through a final story that encourages my audience or I boil down the entirety of my idea into one final sentence. I want to leave my audience with a final positive, positive thought. And the tricky thing there, Jason, is if you have a and a you should actually do that before the Q&A and after. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because yeah, because I guess if someone has a really bad question, they're going to remember that the whole totally. time. Like, do you yeah, like ice exactly. cream? Yes, I like ice cream. Okay, that's all the time we have for right now. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> I mean, ideally in that scenario, you'd be able to turn ice cream, you'd be able to connect it back to your topic, uh, maybe. If you can't do that, it's like, yeah, I love ice cream. Mint chocolate chip is my favorite. Grew up in Philadelphia, so Briars is the very best. But I know we're out of time. Go do this thing, right? Final thought, go do this thing. And that should happen before the Q&A and after the Q&A. If that feels too redundant, I would... I'd give the call to action before the q and I'd take the Q&A, give them a final thought afterwards or final story afterwards. Yeah, and then drop the mic, right? And then drop the mic. Boom. <laughs> Done. Yeah. Awesome. Well, this has been fun. Uh, how can, Wait, uh... can I give you one more? Yeah, go for it. Keep going, man. This occurred to me recently. I worked with this guy who put together this awesome presentation and then never rehearsed it, or maybe he rehearsed it one time. And like, this is the craziest thing in the world. There are, I mean, these are presentations that can like win you business, that can boost your personal credibility, boost your brand, and we just assume like, well, I'll get up on stage and it'll be fine. Like, why in the world do we do that? And most people don't see how much work goes into a really good presentation. There are people who can get up on stage and just wing it, but those are like people with an improv background. Uh, The iPhone keynote, Steve Jobs, he worked on that for like 40 hours. Like an entire work week he spent on that. Wow. I like to say it this way. So I got married two years ago. The day before my wedding, we rehearsed the ceremony. Most people do that the day before their wedding. What is rehearsing a wedding? It is rehearsing things like walking, <laughs> singing, kissing. Right? Like we rehearse those things as if we'd forget how to do those things the next day. Because we consider that day high stakes. So why in the world, if we are rehearsing basic things, walking, standing, kissing, if we're willing to rehearse those for our wedding, like things we basically can't screw up, why in the world do we give presentations and not rehearse them? That's true. So I think, and and I always tell people you should rehearse until you can't mess it up. Not, Mm -hmm. not until you like, you don't rehearse until you get it right. That's just yeah. saying you got it right one time. You still can screw it up after that. Like I always yeah. tell people, like rehearse it until you can't not mess it up. Yeah, right, right, right. Because if you rehearse it seven times in a row, and the seventh time you get it, like you probably just got it because you went through it seven times in a row. If you rehearse it until it becomes a part of you, like the words are a part of you, the whole experience is so much more fun. Yeah. Because you get out there, and you're not going to screw it up. And you can start doing things. You can start adjusting to the crowd. 
you can make jokes that otherwise your brain would be too stressed out to recognize. Uh, when you screw things up, like just basics of like your friend who knocked over the clicker, you don't, because if you're stressed out about that, it's like, oh my gosh, the whole thing's going wrong. But if you're relaxed, like you know what mm -hmm. you're talking about, not a big deal. And that'll happen if you rehearse it. Oh yeah, because there's always going to be things that go wrong on stage. Yeah. You're going to go to that slide with the goofy audio video thing and that's not going to come up and then you're yeah. going to look like, well, this is what it's supposed to do. And then you're just sure. going to sit there and start sweating yeah. profusely yeah. and then you botch the rest of it. Like we've all done that. But, uh, you know, if you're prepared and you expect it and you can just kind of, you, you just feel comfortable. And I, I don't think a lot of people realize, I didn't realize this until I got into speaking, that you have a lot of bags in your back pocket, right? Yeah. That you pull in. And, and so like, as I've seen a number of different speakers from like Gary or Seth Godin or any of these guys, like a lot of it is the same. And they're just going back to material, almost like a comedian that's pulling like right. work that worked before. Right. So right. it's not all new, but the really good ones make it look new. <laughs> right. Cause they've given it enough that it's like, it, it's like a keyboard shortcut in their brain. Like they just dial up. Okay. There's that story. Just press a couple of keys on their computerized brain. The story spits out because they've rehearsed it. They've done it before. Yeah. And, and that's that, really what we should be shooting for. Yeah. And that all goes back to how you started and saying you need to know your audience. And you need to know what you're talking about. You just cannot be like, I got on stage and they want me to talk about this one topic. Like I've turned down speeches because they'd be like, we want you to talk about this. I'm like, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> yeah. Like if I got up there, I would just be like reading from the keynote being like, yes, uh, next slide, next slide. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I mean, good speeches take time. And when they want you to just, I mean, that's actually complimentary to you because they're basically saying like, oh, Jason's good. He'll be able to do this. Maybe. Well, if you can be able to work on it. I would have butchered, butchered it really bad. <laughs> I would have never like got invited back to anything, but well, cool. Well, um, well, how can people reach you, man? What's, uh, what's the Twitter handle that they can uh, hit you up on? Yeah, totally. So, um, it's Twitter is at MPAC, M P A C C like my last name, Pacquiao. Awesome. Uh, I work, the company I work for is called Duarte. So if you can put that in the show notes or something, yeah, I mean, we'll I can do. keep spelling things out, but that would be probably better. Yeah. We'll put that in the show notes. And uh, all right, guys, so here's the thing that you guys are going to probably, the traps you're going to fall into. You're going to listen to this. You're going to get to your office. You're going to get too busy. If you're, if you're too busy, you're not charging enough. And I want you to take one thing from Mike's speech and go implement it and make sure that, and we'll put in the show notes. We'll put the, I think we listed eight or nine things, nine things in there. If you could probably just implement one or two, you're going to be in that much totally. better spot. So, and if you guys like this and you don't want to ever miss out on it, I want you to go to this URL and wait for it. Swank it. Swank dot it. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll never miss out again. That's a good call to action, right? That was good. Bravo, Jason. Yeah, well done. Go. Well done. And the t-shirts are in the, in the mail, right? For it too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mike. Thanks for coming, man. Hey, thanks, man. All right.